How you doing, guys? Well, my name is Davis Abreu. I represent the New York City International Christian Church, and um, I've been a disciple for over six years, faithfully, you know, and uh, it's all by the grace of God. So, um, I'm going to share with you the awesome reason why I love my church. So, this morning, moments ago, I was just praying, and... Um, and just something in my heart, you know, just wanted to share the good news. Wanted to share with so many people why I love my church. And um, so I got some scriptures and uh, I'm just going to share with you why I love my church. And um, hopefully this may inspire you. And if you're not a part of my church, maybe this can inspire you to check out our church. So uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, it says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So pretty much it's saying to don't forget to do good and to share with others. So I'm just going to share with others, and you get an idea of why I love my church and what makes us unique. You know, what makes us different than any other churches, you know? So, um, <clears throat> if you have your Bible with you, take a look at John chapter 15, verses 12. <clears throat> All right. John chapter 15, verses 12. It says, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. That's Jesus speaking. Let's take a look at, at another scripture. Uh, let's, let's go to um, a few verses down, which is John 15, verse 17. And this is Jesus saying, This is my command. Love each other. The key word is love. Now, there's so many different churches out here in this world. So many religion. Like you could have any religion or be a part of any churches in this world, but the key thing, if there's not love, if there's not family, friendship, unity, mind and heart, if there's none of that stuff, then it's meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's just total wasteless. It doesn't matter, you know? And that's the key thing, you know. And um one thing about our church, you know, and I'm just going to share with you how that pertains to this. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, so I could give you guys an idea. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Now, the context of this is when, um, <clears throat> this is the, the, when the day of the Pentecost came. All Israel, the Jews from all nations, came together for the Feast of the First Fruit. And um, Peter, <clears throat> with the keys, <clears throat> boldly was preaching about the last days, which is the physical, nation, the physical nation of Israel and the temple, you know. And also, Jesus' um, crucifixion and what we did to Jesus, how we nailed him in the cross in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. And how Jesus, he is from God, he raised from the dead, we all put him to death, you know. So he preached to hundreds of thousands of people in the day of the Pentecost. And out of all those people, 3,000 was added to the number. So 3,000 became the first century Christian church. A church that's made by disciples. So, what's the responsibility of the church? What makes us different than any other churches? What are, what are we trying to follow that maybe maybe other churches are not looking to follow? Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, 42. So we're going to see what are, the, what are the responsibilities for those 3,000 people that got baptized um, together also with the root number of 120 disciples too, you know, uh, in Acts chapter 1. So... This is a church responsibility. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. 
All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possession and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Now this is awesome. So what are we trying to apply that we're following that's different than anyone else? Well, the key thing is being devoted. In other words, being addicted to the apostles' teachings. Where do we find the apostles' teaching that? The word of God. And to the fellowship. And that's the key thing. Fellowship is really important. Now before, when I used to go to the church in the past, before I became a disciple, churches I used to go to, what common people do after church, once the church is over, the, the sermon is done, you leave and you go straight out the doors. And you just go to your respected homes. Nobody really like greet anyone much. You mostly everyone has their family or their friends, and you know, they just walk out of church and that's it, you know. But my Bible says here we need some fellowship, you know. So with our church, we're not one of those type of church that you just once the sermon is over, you just leave out the door and and bon voyage. No, now we want to get in people's lives. We want to fellowship, you know. We want to be together, get to know each other. Built that love, you know, that foundation. And it also says here, breaking the bread. Okay, we break bread, you know. We also we take participation in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ in communion. We want to make sure we're unified with that. We don't just take that bread that represents Jesus' body and that juice, the blood, which represents Jesus' blood, you know. We don't just take that and and like, you know, like it's just something we got to do. No. Jesus, what Jesus did actually is real. He actually died for all of our sins. He suffered so we could have hope, life, and a future. So we need to remember what Jesus did. And that's why we take bread, you know. And that's the um, breaking the bread what we do as a church. And we also, like the, like the scripture says in here, um, in verse... 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glass and sea of hearts. So it talks about how they also break bread in their homes, you know. They eat together, you know. And um, so we do that as well, you know. Every every time, every service, after service, we eat together. We fellowship. We get closer to each other, you know. That's very important. That's going to keep the unity going, you know. And... Also, prayer. Prayer is the key thing. And uh, if there's no prayer, there is nothing. We always pray before service. We always pray together. And um, I just want to share with you how powerful prayer is um, when, it, when it comes to God's church. You know, this church right here and why I love about this church. Um, let's take a look at James chapter 5, verse 16. It says here, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now, what I love about this scripture and what I love about this church, um, there's many times in my life where, where I was weak, struggling, suffering, you know, going through some hardships and difficulties, you know. And man, being a disciple for six years, I experienced that so many times. And there are times when you feel when you there are gonna be times when you feel weak that um you know sometimes you pray and and you just don't feel it in your heart that 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 um the differences, you know what I mean? You don't feel like you're connecting with God. You can even read the Bible, same here. So when you feel like that, then you kind of like, your spirit is feeling sick. And at that point in time, this is where you turn to, to get the healing. It's call a brother up, or maybe a sister up. Confess your sins. Confess what's in your heart. Let them know what you're going through. And with that person, 
that brother, that sister that you that you calling, is a lot stronger than you spiritually at that point in time. So that person is gonna sh gonna lift you up. It's gonna encourage you. And guess what? Because that person right now is in a righteous state of, of mind and a righteous state at, at that moment. God's gonna hear that prayer, and that prayer is gonna be able to heal you. But you wanna make sure that that um that you're getting open with a brother. But um you know with me like um I like to get open with with, with strong brothers. You know um no like if I wanna just uh, be able to um open breeze openness. You know with the with the weak brothers. You know. I, I'll do that too, you know, just to get them involved, get the, like so they could be able to get open. But the key thing is letting your disciple know what you're feeling, or a strong brother, one uh, 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 in the leadership, you know, let them know what you're feeling, let them pray for you, you know, because right now whatever they're doing, God is pleased with them. That's the reason why they're leading Bible talks or leading regions or even leading the church. So if if they're not in point with God, if they're not righteous with before God, then they will not be in that place to begin with, you know. So God is always working. So these are the kind of people that I want to be able to ask for prayer so they can heal me through their prayer in faith in Christ, you know. So that helped me so much through the period of six years, knowing that anytime I'm suffering, I'm going through some troubles, I get these key brothers to pray for me, to lift me up, to help me through hardship. And that's what's been keeping me going to this day, you know. Many times I felt like I just don't want to pray, like I could pray, I just don't feel it, you know. I feel numb sometimes. I could feel numb in the Bible. It don't work, you know. But just prayer, you know. And that helps a lot. Another key thing is like, okay, there's going to be times when, like, you don't want to pray. There's going to be times when you don't want to get in the Word. There's going to be times when you don't want to accept input from anybody else. You can get the advice. You can still feel numb. You know, now you're really weak. So how do you overcome that? It's great memories. Like, great memories will restore your heart. I have so much memories, great memories from this church. Everything that I have done, that I that I experienced, you know. So, you know, there were times in my life as a Christian, as a disciple, where I experienced that, where I just feel like prayer is not going to work, input is not going to work, the Bible's not going to work. So I just reflect on great memories, you know, how how the memories was like. Like, okay, before you was a Christian. How your life was. How how your life was when the moment when when a brother or sister first shared their faith with you. How that looked like. How was that? The first time you stepped foot into a church, the, your first Bible study, your first baptism. You know, um, the first retreat, church retreat. The first time you just the first time you study the Bible with someone. First time you baptize someone, the first time you just had great fellowship, done so many great things with the church, the times when they've been there for you, you know. So these are like great memories that, like, wow. If you if you are weak, I will tell you the truth. If you reflect on the great memories, you're gonna be, your your heart is gonna be restored. You know, you can do two options: either reflect on the great memories. Or just reflect on the bad memories. But think about it. Reflecting on the bad memories and all the negativity. What is that going to do for you? Is that going to make you better? No, it's going to make you worse. And you know, it's, it's really tricky. That's how Satan is. There's been many times also in my life that I got caught up into um, negativity thinking. Just uh, indulging in, wicked, in wickedness, you know. Like my thoughts, you know. And I'm thinking of bad memories and stuff. But then it's like, it just made me worse. It's just making me weaker. It's not making me strong. So, you know, I had to get open in detail, you know. So um, that's one of the things why I love about my church. Because there's so much great memories. It just, it, you just cannot refuse it. 
He cannot pretend that it never happened, that these memories didn't exist. It did. So, just go back to um, Acts chapter 2, verses 42. Let's go back over there for a quick second. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Now, another thing, one thing we have in common is like, it says right here, verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. That's one of the things that we take serious. We want to be unified in mind and thought. There's so many divisions out here in the church industry today. So many people are not thinking the same. Everybody just want to, it's like Burger King, have it your way, you know, type of Christianity. Uh, you know, the reason why so many people don't want to take this step to really be a part of our church, you know, and really want to study the Bible and be serious because the fear of change, the fear of change, the fear of comfort. Like we're so comfortable with our day-to-day -day life and we know that seeking after God's face, really trying to get involved in God's kingdom, His church, you know, may change, may change some of your comfortability. I'll tell you, do not fear. You know, Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I'm trying to get to heaven. That's where I'm trying to go. Are you trying to get to heaven? You know, everybody wants to get to heaven, but we don't want to do the things that we need to do in order to get to heaven. You know? And it's true. Matthew 6, 33 said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The only way you're going to really see how the church is, how God is going to, is going to lift you up, show you the plans He has for your life, and the, only, uh, and the way you're going to see the love of God through the church, you need to seek first the kingdom. You need to like be a part of the church week after week, month after month, year after year. That's the only way you're going to really see, wow, this church is different than others. This is a church of love. And um, so um, let's take a look at another scripture right here. In John chapter 15, verses 18. Actually, let me just rewind back real quick. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 17. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Awesome. Now here, one of the things that makes us unique, makes us different than many other churches, and why I love about this church is discipling, is mentoring. Every single member in in our whole entire movement has a spiritual mentor. We call that a discipler. It's like Jesus had his 12, so he discipled his 12. He mentors his 12 with discipling, you know, with discipline, you know. So we call that discipler. So I'm grateful for discipling. I'm just going to read the scripture and then you can get a, like, a little idea why we need to be grateful. Now it says here, Hebrews 13 verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no advantage to you. So, so God appoint people over your life and to keep your account, to help you through your life. Like, literally, why are we sometimes could be burdened when uh, when we have disciples that are trying to, like, help us, but sometimes we could just be, like, like uh, defensive, you know, or we may not give our hearts. We may, th we may think they're out to get us and stuff. Like, literally, my Bible says here, if they're, you know, God, see, God judges the motives of the heart. So if, like, if we was to have mentors and all they want to do is just make us worse, What's the point of that? These disciples, these mentors, people in our life, they want to help us be great. They want to help us in any way, you know? So um, are we not to, to submit to the, to our leaders? You know, I know submit is a tough word sometimes because our pride is like, like, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do, you know? But so, okay, you don't want nobody to quote unquote tell you what to do. So you want to do things your own, right? So how old are you? Ask yourself this. Throughout your life to this day, where you at? 
where you are today? Have you accomplished many goals? Have you done big things? Have you inspired so many people? Where are you at today? Exactly. That's what your ways did. So obviously your ways don't work. My ways don't work. But get involved with discipling. You know, it's, that's like a personal Jesus to help you be great, to meet your needs in any way, you know, to help you. And to my shame, there was times in the past where I just didn't give my heart to my disciples, you know, in the past. And, you know, that's my shame. And I had to repent. And, you know, there's some times where that could be difficult. But, you know what? I need to just see from the scriptures that it says here, Obey them so that their work would be a joy, not a burden. For that would be a no advantage to you. What advantage would it be to have someone to counsel you in the Lord? What are they getting out of it? Are they getting paid for it? No. This is free. <laughs> People spend thousands of dollars getting counseling off, outside to help them through life. While well, we get that for free. Anytime, any day, you have access to a disciple to help you through your life, to help you get open, to help you with your heart. That's why I love about this church, you know. And so... I want to make my disciple joy, hard to be a joy and not a burden, you know, because that has no advantage to me. So that's what I'm really grateful to have discipling in my life to help me through life, through challenges, you know. And man, I had a tough week. I had a tough week. Every single year, I will have a tough year. You know, it's nothing new. You can either do two things, either complain about it or do something about it. Only one is not going to give you a, one mo most likely is not going to give you a chance of hope. But the other one will. You got either faith or you got no faith. Faith, complain, faith, why? At the end of the day, faith gives you a better chance for success than complain and why, you know? So let's take a look at another scripture right here in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verses 18 to 20. It says here, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. I am going to tell you the truth. Living in New York or living in your in your respected hometowns, yeah, it's going to feel like it hates you. When you go through those hard times, those difficulties, those challenges where 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 you look at your pockets and you don't have no money or or any trials in your life, anything from um your emotional hardship Physical hardship, medical hardship, you name it. We all been there, done that. We all have those things. It's going to feel like this thing that's over us, we call it the world. Like, it's going to feel like it hates us. Like, it wants to just destroy us. You know, even people. You're going to have family, friends that's going to persecute you. That's going to just say you're out of your mind. Why are you spending another week in that church? Take some time. Breathe in, breathe out, you know? Like you're gonna get all these persecution, all these like nonsense, these these not good advices, you know, from people that are not disciples, you know. But Jesus says here the world hates you, it hated me first. So yeah, look how much people hated Jesus uh through the time when, when he was going through his crucifixion. You know? His people understood what he stand for, but the other people didn't. You know, they was just haters, you know, persecutors, you know. They didn't understand him. They were jealous, you know. But you got to understand that, um, that living in your cities, two things is going to happen. It's either going to make you or break you. It's going to make you into a man, a man of God or a woman of God, or it's going to break you into pieces. You know, which Satan wants. It's going to make you complain. Why? It's going to make you lose for short. It's going to make you into a child. So, um, 
All right. In closing, let's take a look at our last scripture. And um, we're going to take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. And this is like one of my favorite scripture. So guys, as we go through our discipleship, we are going to go through sufferings. But why I love about my church is we suffer together. And um, it says here, verse 12, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering, as though something strange was happening to you. <laughs> but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be like a murderer or a thief or any kinds of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for a righteous to be saved, what will be of the ungodly and the sinners? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So why I'm reading this is just to see that as Christians, we will suffer. Don't be surprised. Like, oh my God, I sinned. My whole world is coming down. Oh my God, I did this, I did that. Like, duh, you're a sinner. Just like me. And that's why, you know, we need each other to confess our sins, to get open, you know. Proverbs says the righteous fall seven times, but we get up. So God knows you're going to fall. God knows you're going to sin, but you got to get up. But how would it be if you have no one to help you, to help lift you up? There's a reason why Jesus always get people together in two, you know. And you need people in your life to help you through hardship. So God has helped me through so many hardships through this church. And that's why I love this church a lot. And this church is just pretty much all I have to live for, you know. So, um, so guys, like, we in this together. You're not alone. This church is real. Yeah, some of you persecutors going to be like, oh, man, this ICC, uh, they believe they're the only church. All right, if you think there's other churches, fine, go. Go find it. Good luck. Hopefully, you can find them. Good luck. This is, that's what you want to do? If you think there's other churches better, help yourself. Nobody forcing you to stay in our church. But ICC, this is a family of God. We are the kingdom. And yeah, we stick together. We love together, we eat together, and we will die together. This is who we are. And this is why I love my church. Amen. So I hope this encourages you. You know, and just know at the end of the day, I'm on, I want to close out with this one more last scripture right here. Um, bear with me one second here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25, it says, So that there should be no divisions in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Guys, let's get unified. Let's not divide from each other. You know, let's get open with each other. Let's not get let's not be bitter with each other. Because Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Don't be bitter at anyone. Get open. Get resolved in detail. We love this church. This is our family. We don't want to harm anyone. We just want to love everyone, you know? Who are we? Like, if we believe in this, do you not know that God would judge us? He would judge every hidden sin in our hearts? Like, if he was to just go, like, feel like we just 
if dwelling in negativity with our brothers or sisters, you know, or trying to do anything foolish, that's not us. Don't be deceived by Satan, guys, you know. That's Satan itself, you know. So do not be divided. If you have a problem, you know, take it to that brother. If that brother or sister is defensive, then you know what? They got to get their hearts right, you know. That's not what the Bible said, be defensive. It said you got to humble yourself, you know. We're trying to be unified, you know. If we have issues in our heart, the Bible calls us to get open. It calls us to have a clear conscience. So you need to respect that. And that's what I love about our church because, we, you know, not that we're perfect, but, you know, we hold on to this command, you know, so that we can stay together, be unified, you know. And like I said, at the end of the day, um, we have concerns from each other. So are we, are we just like either calling you because you didn't keep the church, you're sick or whatever it is, you know, or we see you down and we're trying to encourage you, we're trying to help you anyway. We're concerned. That's what the Bible says, to be concerned from each other. So we do what the Bible says. So um, that's why I love about my church, why I love about this church, because we have great concerns for each other you know so guys i love you so much and um pray for me so um i can stay faithful you know um this is why i'm faithful to this day because of my total gratitude with god and the kingdom i've been to so many trials i don't just be six years for no reason i've been to a lot of trials financially emotionally physically you name it but I'm here because of my gratitude towards God and the church. So I love you guys. To God be the glory. Amen.